Ladies and gentlemen, joining us in a moment of drama as we've just been teaching Scotsman technology. And it did go, we're building a wall we had to do to keep the muggers out. But let me tell you now, when you, when you start getting on Skype, but what was that like? Uh, it was, um, I think that was the most stressful thing I've done today, apart from putting my socks on. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> we got there, we got there, um, still sweating from it. Tom was a master of help all the way. I was stressed out. Tom, <laughs> Tom was awesome, wasn't he? Tom had made a good foreman. He was like the, I mean, talk about the strong, silent type. He sat there looking like a rock and said, call. For, for like 20, just like shaking his head every now and again. Like like a like backseat driver, weren't you, on that? So he's like, it's not happening, this. Oh, I tell you, you fit well in the oil rigs. That's what the majority of the gaffers do in the oil rigs. They don't say anything to your face, but then Tom be flagging us later off to, the, to his wife, you know, so... <laughs> For those of you who, who haven't already guessed, I'm joined today by the Stoltman brothers mm. in the Golden's finest. And hey, now that you've been kept off training, mate, you can see that that, that Luke's already <laughs> pigging out. Every opportunity you get to get massive. That's what it's all about. <laughs> I just enjoy putting things in my mouth, Neil. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I used to know a woman like that. Yeah, she left me. Anyway, it's another story. Any, well, let's talk about the, 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 the white elephant in the room, guys. What is going on outside the doors with all this coronavirus? That must have played hell with your training routine. It's, um, so, I mean, fortunately for us, we have our own gym. So it's uh, a couple of units up. Not a commercial gym, but we open it to the public. So fortunately for us, we're not in lockdown as of yet, um, and where we are, it's very remote, so we're quite, um, we're, it's bad, obviously, but it, it could be worse. I mean, the worst stuff for us, I think, for Tom and I, and for all other athletes out there, and yourself, is the cancellation of, you know, all the shows, and, you know, in turn, and that kind of hampers with the, the income, you know, that's what we kind of, wouldn't say rely on, but if we do well in a competition, we can make. I mean, to win Europe's strongest man and the long lifting championships, I think that was nigh on 35,000, which is, you know, keep you in, you know, bread and water for a week, you know. So that's yeah, that's it. I mean, we, or Tom, two days. It's just, I, I don't know. I mean, we're training, a lot of people rely on training. You know, with the mental health aspect of it all, um, I, I don't think I get the government have to say, you know, we've got to do this, we've got to do that. But, you know, look at the bigger picture after we come out of quarantine, lockdown, whatever. The mental health aspect of it all still has to be taken into consideration because, you know, all these people with mental health issues, um, you know, and, and that's not saying that Tom and I haven't suffered from that. You know, everyone goes through their ups and downs, but to be locked up, cooped up, and not able to have that release of endorphins and that kind of feel goodness that you get from when you, yeah. when you train, um, I think that's going to cause some major issues. So, I mean, again, we're just two, like, two meatheads that go to the gym and lift stuff, you know, but. I mean, I think that the government should maybe have a little bit more of a, um open, open mindedness to, to kind of letting people train. You know, that's something that people rely on for a release, and, and people need that. You know, people need that to live. Um, so I, I don't know. I mean, but again, back to your question, we're getting on okay. You know, we've got um, this evening we're going in for a training session. So what Tom and I are doing now is. Making sure that it's just Tom and myself in the gym when we're training um, to minimise our kind of contact with other people. Um, yeah. Just to be responsible. You know, that's, I think that's all we have to do at the moment. Um, and we've got some events tonight. Or, or events. Yeah. Small, press. Small, press. Small press. So so what have you got going on tonight, mate? Uh, small press. And just upper body stuff. Just to maintain, obviously... Because you know, some of the man got cancelled. So uh, I just want to maintain my log and try and get it strong for the rescheduled events. So that's the that's it. And it's on the 
you would have loved we got as well. So I don't know if you've seen that. It's looking at spicy. Mm-hmm. So. <laughs> <laughs> spicy stuff. Now then, you, obviously, uh, I mean, you mentioned there keeping social distancing and staying two metres apart. That's, you know, it's quite risky and pretty hard to do when you're spotting your brother as he does a 220 bench. <laughs> Probably not ideal. It's like, like where, where were you, mate? Well, that's, that's two metres away. So when, yeah. when you dropped it on yourself, nothing I can do. But, well, you know, it's every everyday hazards. But I know, Tom, you've just got back from Ohio. It must have been like bloody zombie fest out there because obviously you competed. But nobody was there. Yeah, no, we were both there. We were both there. Uh, hmm? It was, it was pretty, uh, it was pretty weird, but it was good for the likes of us because we didn't have like two hundred fifty thousand people swarming over us, so much more space and much more kind of freedom to kind of just relax and do what we kind of do best, and that was just to go over there and lift, lift a world record and then go home, which is yeah. what we kind of have to do in the end. So that yeah, was weird for. Like Jimmy Arnold, so uh, so empty. It was that was really really weird, really really weird. And particularly surreal in a place like the Arnold's. If if you for, for those people who haven't been to the Arnold Classic in Ohio, the sort of mothership of the Arnold Classic, it is incredibly congested. It's one of the sort of monster uh, strength and fitness expos. It's right there with the FIBO. Part. It's massive. And, you know, you, you, you get an incredible amount of people crammed in there. So to not see that, to not have it like that, must have been pretty surreal, pretty weird, lads, to be honest. Very much so. You know, it's, um, you know, we walked in uh, Friday, Friday, Friday morning and there was no stalls. You know, it was just this mass of open space, um, which was, uh, it, it was kind of mind-blowing, you know, to think, Tom and I were there. Tom was competing in the amateur Arnolds five years, mm-hmm. five, five years ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, when we're out there, like you say, Leo, it's, it's incredible. Uh, you know, the close proximity, everyone, you know, you're rubbing shoulders with everyone. And, you know, we're talking about a breeding ground for germs, you know, for viruses. Yep. I, can, I can obviously see why they decided to go with that, um, that kind of closure of it, as it were. Um, it, it was it was it was a strange atmosphere uh, in, in that sense. You know, normally when we compete in Giants Five, uh, World's Ultimate Strongman, World Strongman, all these big shows, we've got a nice crowd and there's a good atmosphere. But there it was very, very kind of subdued because no one knew what was going on. It was very everyone was looking on on tenter hooks kind of thing. You know, it was, it was mm. a bit of a, a strange one. But never, nevertheless, I mean. I went out there to try and get the long world record. It didn't happen for me. I was more thinking my plan was to do a Europe strongest man, which is cancelled, which is one of those things. Yep. The, big man, the big man here. Mm-hmm. Obviously went out, actually got two world records in what he did. So he lifted the, the lighter stone, which was uh, five, six, five, six, five pounds, I think. So two, two. 56 kilograms, and, uh, which was a world record in itself, you know, it was, and then, what, then they had to go on to the heavier one. Yeah, 602, 602 pounds, so 273 kilograms, so, <laughs> so yeah, wow. Yeah, I mean, I mean, to, be, to be honest, you're making a bit of a habit of this, Tom, <laughs> in terms of the world records, mate, I mean... I got, you know, funny story for you. Um, I got shouted at online. Lots of people shouting at me online for uh, for being too loud at the giant live event. Yeah, yeah, too loud and too excited when you at the culmination of Britain's Strongest Man. Apparently, I would put you off. I couldn't believe it. But yeah, I thought, well, I didn't put him off too badly because the guy just did the world record, but. Joking aside, sort of taking my my personal pride out of it entirely, um, I think the fact that I got that excited, that it's rare that I do, but the fact that I did um, is because I was into it that much. I mean, that, that, that climax to Britain's Strongest Man was 
I've never seen anything like that in a strongman event ever in any strongman event. I mean, and it, and and I'm and I'm going to take that in context a little bit because it wasn't just the the actual world record and the final between yourself and Adam. It was the fact that we were all looking at how the points were going to tally up, and the fact that you came out, Luke, and sort of gave your little brother the biggest helping hand you possibly could by setting yeah. your PB and taking yeah. the lead in the I mean it was just a ridiculous it's like it's like it was scripted it was nuts I mean was it as was it as sort of dramatic at the time for you guys or are you so caught up in the moment you it, it's only when you look back you see that I just wanted to do the stone right uh, run off my life because I wanted to win the title so uh, when I beat Bishop and then I didn't know if I beat it. I didn't know if I thought it was faster than Luke or not, so it was kind of like, just looked straight at the leaderboard and was like, where am I? Am I first, second, third? I thought Luke had beaten me once I did it because the third one stumbled again, so I thought Luke was the faster stone run than me, which would have been, oh, king of the stones then, you know? So I'd have been like, oh. Uh, nah, that would have, been, that would have been a long ride back to Invergordon, mate, if that would have happened. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, afterwards, I was just kind of like, I got the world record, but then the title went to Bish, which was, you know, Bish deserved it. But like the world record, I was kind of, didn't realize I went so fast. You know, I thought maybe 17, 18 seconds, but to get a 16 point, whatever it was, it was, yeah, it was cool. It was a cool wee thing to do. A cool, a cool wee thing to do, right. On to the next one. <laughs> A cool wee thing to do. A cool wee thing to do. Let's just let's look into that statement, guys. Talk about humility. If you if you look at strongman and the history of strongman, the one defining event in yeah. strongman, the one that is the underlying underpinning event of strongman is the stones. So if yeah. you're gonna go for a world record. That's like the one in it. How many, you know, everybody's done the stones. Everybody wants that. And you are the man. That has got to feel pretty bloody good, Tom Stolman. <laughs> <laughs> How hard you been to live with after that, Luke? Is it, I bet you're getting that a lot, aren't you? It's just the endless. I just, I just switch it off now, you know. It's just one of those I can, uh, I don't know, I can, I like the feeling I think with Tom. It's um because that's actually Tom, he's got three three world records now. He's got the the oh, key really ten really stone really runs that he did in the ultimate world the world's ultimate strong man in Dubai. So in there, so Brian Shaw actually had the world record initially. He went yeah. up and did it like a minute. Minute and one minute and one yeah. seconds, which was an incredible time. Brian's phenomenal apple stones. I'm thinking, Jesus, this is gonna be hard for Tom to beat. And then he came in and he did 40 seconds, and it was a 40 second stone run from 100 to 200 kilos in I don't know, the 210, yeah. or, the 210 yeah. or something. You know, and then this is like in 36, 37 degree heat. Um, your car heat is obviously melting and all this stuff. Um, so for Tom, Tom basically beat Brian's record by 20 seconds, which is, you know, no one beats a world record by 20 seconds. It's phenomenal. No. I and mean, then obviously the giant fly he held now holds that the fastest one there, and now he holds the the heaviest stone ever lifted. So, you know, three world records, and he's only just getting started. You know, it's that's the sca that's the scary one, isn't it? Oh, uh, I have nightmares about it. Even, honestly, it's, it keeps me up at night, just crying. Oh. Myself. Yeah, I mean, people talk about size and frame and, you know, genetic gifts and this, that and the other. And people will see that, you know, if you've seen Tom on TV, mm. if you've seen Tom when you sat in the arena at one of the giant shows, you get a better idea of just how big this man is. I mean, I'm not a big guy, but I'm not a small guy. I'm like six foot one and around 105 kilograms. And he makes you feel like a child stood next to your dad when you, you know, you feel like asking him if he can have an ice cream. It's taking the absolutely ridiculous. I mean, that is the kind of dude you do not want to climb down off the top bunk of the prison cell when you've just been sent sent down for riding your bike without lights, isn't it? Uh, you don't need that in your life. But oh, no. hey, that's, that's big Tommy for you. 
<laughs> now let, let's let's focus on you for a minute here, Luke. Obviously, you, you know you. It's been a quite a unique journey watching you lads develop and watching you come up, and it's interesting. And I want to sort of talk to you both about this while you're together because there's a there's a difficult scenario in some respects that you were the lead into strongman you were the guy that sort of got the the, the, the your your foothold in the sport and you brought effective your your little big brother through and back in the day you were the guy who had your nose in front when we were watching the early giants events just before tom started competing there there was sort of these rumors of you know Oh, he's Luke Stoltman, and he's got one back home that's even bigger than that, you know. And yeah, you, but you'd never seen Tom, you know. All <laughs> yeah. you did is sometimes he'd come to events with you, and while your water was stood on the bloody in the cafeteria, now and again he'd walk past and you'd see the bloody water start moving. But other than that, nobody had actually seen him. Yeah. Then he started to do events, and you were always in front of him. As I say, you were you were winning, you were finishing, but even at that time. You were always the guy, which is something I've, I've always taken my hat off to you, mate. You were always talking about your brother then. Even before he really got going, he used to say, my brother, my brother, my brother, my brother, all the time, telling telling everybody you'd listen behind the scenes in the hotel about how good your brother was going to be. And yet, over that period of time, mate, you've developed into a bad mother fluffer in a lot of areas. And I mean, hey, you're one of the best log. You're one of the best overhead pressers in the game. Period. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. this is the thing: you've got that. You're very, very well rounded. So, just walk me through that whole concept. You must. It must mess I mean, with your mind a bit. No, I don't think it messes with my mind at all. I mean, I've. Uh... With my mental strength, the mental aspect of the game, I feel that I'm one of the best and one of the strongest that there is there. Mm. Um, I don't let things get me up. I don't go up or down. You know, if I do well in an event, I'm happy to go to the next event and do it. But it was more that I knew Tom's potential from an early, early doors. You know, Tom was just frightening. You know, he had this height, he had this kind of almost. Um, he doesn't have an understanding for what we is and what the capabilities are. And that's why you see him pick up, like in the World's Strongest Man final last year, picking up that arm ball and just straight straight left and go. Everyone else is picking it up and messing it up. And so Tom doesn't have that kind of, that, that kind of, oh, that's going to be heavy. It's just another object. You know, no so mental I, restriction. Exactly. Yeah. That's, I, I noticed that in Tom from uh, quite an early stage when we started training. Um, but then for me to, I mean, I'm always going to be the bigger brother, you know, the older brother, maybe not bigger, but certainly older. Um, and I want what's best, you know, family is a massive thing for me. So, so I just want to see Tom really achieve his potential. Mm. But then when you see Tom get so strong and so good in, in his events that he's really good at, it's really spurred me on, it's really pushed me on to think, you know, last year when he became the first brother in history and world's strongest man to become the world's strongest brothers. So I think that's come from both of us kind of pushing each other on in training and throughout the competitions. And I mean, I know now, um, finishing second in, in, in Dubai last year for me, that's, that's a world stage. Those guys that you're competing against, the JF Caron's, uh, who else? Linda Heinler, Terry Hollins, all the, the world-class athletes are mm -hmm. coming second only just to Matthias um, Kielskowski. It's That was such a... And beating Brian Shaw as well. You know, that's massive for yeah. me to do that. And now I, I truly believe going into any competition. I mean, I'm, I was looking going into Europe. I'm thinking, you know, I could win that show. I, I, that's how I think now. So I could win that. Well, if you get your long press up, you could. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, but then again, I can I, I say that to Tom as well. So when we're prepping for shows, we're both having that same the, the visual, visualization is that we're wanting to go in now and win it. Because um, back, like you said, back when I first started, I was you know finishing that bad Tom, 
Um, but it was only maybe a couple of places. So people ask me what it's like to, if Tom beats me or do you want to beat Tom? And I said, yeah, of course I want to beat Tom, but I want to beat every other guy in the show. You know, I'd rather, you know, finish in front of all of them and then Tom and I share the podium first and second. You know, that's that's what I want from Tom and I. Um, so it's not just about beating Tom, it's about beating your half floors, your Brian Shaw's, the Pace Cruz Krowski, the, you know, well, the British guys, Arvin Bishop, excuse me, um, all these guys, and then, you know, I'm wanting to prove that I am the best pressure in the world. Um, I think that it's, there's some great guys pressing at the moment. We see Iron Buddy, Graham Hicks, um, they're huge pressers, but I think mentally, um, and this isn't any disrespect to anyone at all, but mentally I think I can handle these big occasions, you know, in Europe from this man in front of the 10, 12,000 people that we've got. Um, I can handle that very well. And I, mean, I think that just gives me the edge sometimes. Um, maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. Maybe I'll go and, you know, uh, trap myself come the next big competition. But uh, for me, the mental strength has come uh, so valuable for me, you know, kind of in World's Strongest Man, all these giant slides shows that you're competing against guys with big personalities. And then I think that Tom and I have become one of the biggest personalities on the stage in, in Strongman now, which is, I think, a testament to almost having that belief in the process. You know, it's, mm-hmm. it's been a, a long journey for Tom and I, um, kind of like eight years now, and, and now we're kind of keeping on the top levels where no top ten in the world, and I mean, if Worlds happens this year, touch with the well, I mean, we're looking to you know come podium, get that top spot. I mean, that's what we're our aim goal is now, and I can happily, quite confidently say that for the both of us. I think on any given day, any any you know, pick your good events, if your good events come up, yeah, why not? I'm going to go for it. I'm going to show that I'm one of the best in the world and finish in that podium. And that's the funny thing, isn't it? Because we had we had Loz on the other day, and Loz was talking about the fact that um, sometimes his one frustration with these events is, or these shows, is that there isn't enough events in there to really show who is the best. And and he told me something that I'm very very aware of. Um, but maybe people out there, and that's only because of my proximity to the sport. But maybe many people out there aren't aware that. When you guys show up at an event, you pretty much have a good idea of who's going to do what and who's going to finish where, simply based on, number one, the event mix. Mm. Number two, where those events will will fall in terms of who's, you know, because if somebody's got a much, much better event than someone else and yet they've just come off the back of an event which is going to have physically destroyed them so in other words it's created more of a blurring of the boundaries then that affects the whole outcome but you guys because you're very in tune with who's in what position in the sport and where your form is at that time you obviously train together and so on you've always got a pretty good read on who's going to do what you know um mm. and Loz said that now, now what i wanted to ask you guys was does it frustrate you at all that there's sort of a, a very similar mix of events sometime at the, at the big shows? Or would you like to see that shook up a little bit? Yeah, uh, mixed up. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, as long as they keep the stones. Or yeah. are you thinking like, you know, just five yeah. stones events? Yeah, You'd be yeah. all right, Tom. <laughs> five, five best events. <laughs> um, yeah, I think, you know, with the, it's a tough one because... Obviously, we're doing these one-day shows now, so for them, uh, the organisers, to fit anything more than five events with the 12, 13 athletes that we do, it's going to lengthen the, the course of the, the kind of the evening. That we, you know, it's going to going to go run into extra time kind of thing. So I get that we can only have five events, but it would be nice maybe do it over two days. You know, have eight events because I think. If we could have more events, if you have one bad event, put it that way, if you have one bad event in a five day show, you're screwed. So you can't win that show. So, that to me, the strongest guy is always going to win, obviously. But 
yeah, it would be nice just to have a little bit of a mix up. Um, there's so I mean that was the beauty of Strongman of old back in the you know the eighties, the kind of Jeff Capes and John Paul days. You know it was so varied, crazy events that they did. Um, but the strong, strongest guy always won. You know that was always the the beauty of, of strength and in Strongman. It was always the strongest guy's always going to win. So okay, it's nice to see these Mark Stedler, Mark Slog. Um, but we've had that for the last kind of few years now. They've never had a, I mean, I guess it's, it's difficult, maybe like a squat event. They haven't had a squat event in any giant shows I've done. Um, you know, it's, it would be nice to incorporate something like that, just to mix it up, just to keep the crowd. And I think for the crowds as well, you've got to be original, don't you? You can't just have deadlift, overhead press, moving event, um, a grip event in stones. You know, you've got to kind of, Maybe mix up again. Um, for me, I, I I think the perfect blueprint for a successful strength um, sport, if you will, is the CrossFit Games. So there's a multi-billion pound industry now. The CrossFit Games, love it or hate it, they're successful in what they do, and they keep it so varied every year. It's, it's such a different dynamic. The CrossFit Games, but what they do, I think, is over three or four days they compete and they have. You know, however many events they have, and then they have, I think this year they had a cap after the first event, actually, which was quite brutal. But I think that would be something that we could almost copy. You know, if the blueprint's there for a, a show or a, a, a sport such as CrossFit, which is quite similar in certain aspects to Strongman, um, you know, you've got a live crowd there, um, you've got, you know, maybe three events a day, whatever it is. And it's so successful, it's, I mean, why wouldn't you just try it? You know, why, that blueprint's here, just copy it and let's kind of re, reinvent Strongman a little bit. Because um, I think we need to do it. Because it's, it's, at the moment, it's, it's so popular, Strongman, certainly in the UK, but I think worldwide, we've still got untapped um, potential out there that we could really kind of, do with kind of, you know, getting that kind of full potential out of it. And then I think for, for us athletes, you know, that's when we start to see the reward, the money goes up. Um, because that's, that's now, now we can't, we can't say that we don't do strong man for money um, when we're competing at this level, because that's one of the reasons we do it. We love it. We've, we've been there. I've competed in car parks and, you know, grass fields in the rain and, you know, I've got no money for it. With my five titles that I've won at Scotland, I had to actually pay to do that. So mm. I never won money for that. Um, but now that the people are making a lot of money off it, so it's time to give back to athletes and, you know, say, look, guys, we appreciate how hard working. Um, the money's been the same for X amount of years. Let's pump the money up for you. Um, and I think that needs to happen quite quickly. Ladies and gentlemen, we are going to have a lot more from these two lads. If you're enjoying the show, look out for part two because it's coming very, very soon. In the meantime, like, subscribe, share, tell your parents, tattoo it on your floppy dog. We don't really care. Just let everybody know where we're at and we'll be back with part two with these two guys super soon. Biggity bong. <laughs>